Welcome to the Global Star Party. Uh, welcome to your weekly show uh, where we show off live views from all sorts of places in space. Uh, this is the Australian stroke New Zealand stroke anyone on that side of the planet nighttime edition. So we should be getting some live views of things from Australia. Well, actually, in this year, it's just New Zealand. Let's be honest with you, Paul has once again rescued us. This one. Although, although actually, no, no, I think Andrew, Andrew still has Saturn and what have you, so, anyway, welcome, <laughs> welcome to the crazy show, uh, we bring every week, uh, Saturday, Sunday, depending on your time zone, a live view of things in space, uh, with a bunch of people, uh, some brilliant people, talking about what we're looking at, the science behind it, how we get it, and generally speaking, uh, up and coming events, uh, we, last week we had, uh, some wonderful discussion on New Horizons and um, the rapidly approaching uh, mission to Pluto, uh, which I will actually check how far that one is away from Pluto pretty soon. Getting there, it's very close. Um, so yes, welcome. Um, it's actually sunny cloudy here. I might be able to score one from England and actually get some live sun, maybe. Um, now. Uh, might be some severe rain in a second. I have to run outside and rescue my telescope. But before I waffle on too long, I shall introduce everyone who is with us tonight. So my co-host and the, well, his, his hair is growing back a little bit now. We have Dylan. <laughs> Hey, how are you, everybody? I'm Dylan O'Donnell, broadcasting from Australia, Byron Bay, in the northern parts of New South Wales. Um, lucky to have dark skies here. Not so lucky to have a lot of cloud and tropical rain here. So uh, this is the fifth episode, and I still haven't got a telescope feed for you. Um, but I'll just um, hopefully help with some of the discussion and share some of the photos from our Flickr feed um, that the viewers have uh, sent to us through the week. And uh, But we do have some other astronomers as well. We do indeed, and I don't know if he's talking yet or if he's still busy scribbling away trying to get us some live views of things in space, but we have Paul Stewart once again with us tonight. Hello from New Zealand. Uh, so are we chalking up another score for New Zealand then tonight? No clouds yet. Check you out. All righty. Uh, so this is Paul Stewart, folks, and next to him in the, the column below, we have Kevin, who joins us once again. Hi, guys. find myself in the same boat as Dylan this weekend with uh, rainy skies and uh, not very much chance of getting any live views from me, I'm afraid. But uh, it's always good to have you here. Yeah, it's always good to have you here, Kevin. And Thank also you. joining us, we have Andrew. Good evening. And where are you coming from yeah, today? Yeah, I'm, I'm from... <laughs> we did it again. Uh, I'm from <laughs> Adelaide, South Australia. Um, got clear skies tonight, so um, I'll show some uh, views of um, a couple of images I'm taking, as, as well as uh, that might show the moon and Saturn, if I can. Fantastic. So we've got some planets and some moon, and we also have just had join us uh, Trevor. Hello, Trevor. How are you going, guys? Okay. Do we have any live views from you tonight? No, mate. I'm cl totally clouded over. Oh, no. 
Well, good to have you with us. And also joining us with uh, some some epic imaging going on here, we've got Hugh. Hello. Um, and where are we coming uh, from? Uh, I'm in the middle of Sydney in Australia, so fighting the light pollution, but I'm doing some uh, HA on Centaurus A at the moment, and in a very short amount of time I'm going to swing over to the Trippard and grab some S2 and O3 to get a Hubble pallet. That is going. awesome. And I can't believe it, because we were just saying... So breaking it. news. Breaking <laughs> news. <laughs> breaking news. Russell's joined us. Yes. <laughs> Mind blown. Hello, Russell. Oh. Hi, everybody. Hi, Russell. And friends. Hello. <laughs> and Russell is coming from Nova Scotia Hello? in Canada. He is coming from Canada. Um, so that means it's, I have no idea what time it is in Canada, but if it's midday here and dark in Australia, I'm guessing it's dark and early in Canada, I'd have guessed. My time 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Check it out. Uh, do we you have can, any live... <coughs> so say, do we have any live views from Russell, or is it uh, just a, a ghostly voice joining us today? Uh, well, I was clouded out. Oh no! Oh, okay. yeah. It's all right. We're we're all fighting. We're fighting some things here. I'm fighting clouds. I will bring live eventually, but I am going to skip straight over to Dylan, who wants to uh, uh, show us. Well, I'm going to say a pretty wide view of the night sky from down south. Okay. So this is a photo that um, is obviously a bunch of photos, but they've all been taken pretty much in the last 30 days, maybe 40, 40 to 45 days. Um, so it, it's a bit of a highlight and a bit of an overview of the context of a lot of the objects that we show here on the show and that we get the chance to see in the southern night sky over the winter months. Um, we get this galactic core, it's um, the big uh, middle arm, of the spiral galaxy of the Milky Way, which just has some remarkable targets within it. Um, so I've, I've shot the Lagoon Nebula, the Cat's Paw Nebula, Lobster Nebula, Mega Centauri, the massive globular cluster, and a Chicken Nebula, a running Chicken Nebula, which I think is a terrible, terrible renamed Dragon Nebula or something. Um, it's really magnificent. Um, <laughs> the Chicken Nebula is quite a spectacular object, and of course the Great and, and not, um, not uh, badly named the Great Carina Nebula um, <laughs> in the top there. That's fantastic. But that gives you an idea of just how rich um, this area is. And there's so much more in, in here that I've been in, obviously, but uh, uh, Centaurus A is in here and, and a bunch of others as well. So that will give you some context for the West Indies objects that we are seeing over our Australian Southern Hemisphere skies tonight are coming Awesome. I was going to say, I'm, I, once again, I am somewhat jealous of that view. I say this every episode, but I'm still jealous of that view. Um, if someone could flip the planet quickly for me, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say, if anyone watching us tonight, uh, you should be able to join us and ask questions via the Q&A app, which is enabled. So if you're watching this either on the event page or on YouTube, uh, there should be a little thing uh, down at the bottom somewhere, he says, pointing to some arbitrary area of the screen. It's, it's somewhere around here. Um, and you can click on that, and you can ask us questions, um, ask us to see if you can find an object, um, and hopefully, you know, not, not talk to us too much. And there's yeah, some... Well, none of us are really um, qualified. <laughs> as far as I know, I'm, I'm definitely not qualified, but... Um, We'll, we'll quickly Google things and try and, and make ourselves look knowledge, knowledgeable on the subject. Well, if it's anything to do with the sun or, or a planet, I can normally answer the question. If it's a, craters on the moon, I'm doomed, uh, so don't ask me about that one. And if it's anything deep sky and in the south, uh, yeah, that's that's all Paul. Just just saying, that's that's all Paul. <laughs> yeah. um, although, talking of, talking of uh, deep sky and south, uh, we have something from Andrew here. Andrew, what are we looking at? Okay, this is the uh, M7, Mesia 7. Wow. Uh, just taking it through uh, Backyard EOS at the moment. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Um, now, I, again, I'm not an expert, and I'm not, but I'm not Google. My hands are in the screen, so you can tell I'm not typing anything. Um, that's, uh, that's a cluster of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's an open star cluster, yes. <laughs> which which may uh, or may run, not have been mistaken. 
Like I say, that may or may not have been mistaken for a comet. Uh, that's why it's on that catalogue, because, you know, he was like, no, no, I'm looking for comets. I'm going to write down everything I don't want to look at. And he managed to write down some really good stuff to look at. So uh, thank you for that one, uh, Charles Messier. Well, I can't remember what years you lived in, but, you know, thanks for that. It's definitely not a comet, though. Definitely not a comet. <laughs> Uh, that, that is fantastic. What's the exposure time you're using to get that one for us? Uh, that's just 45 seconds, uh, ISO 800 on a Canon 1100D through an 8-inch F4 telescope. Nice. That F4 is definitely helping there because I try and take a photo of any cluster and I'm, yeah, a bit longer than that for exposure. Very nice. Um, and now I'm going to skip over to Paul here, who is bringing us... Um, I'm going to use my expert knowledge in this one. Stars. <laughs> Knowing that is something spectacular, like um, I don't know, a series or something. <laughs> yes, Paul splits. Uh, yeah, he, he splits some double stars for us so much that we're seeing more even in between them. What well, are we looking at? That movement there in the, in the middle. What's that for? Yeah, it's not quite live, but over the last couple of hours, we've been taking a five-minute exposures. And this mm -hmm. is asteroid 4867 Nimoy. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> after <laughs> Little Nimoy. Did you hear fantastic. that, folks? He just knocked it out the park. That is incredible. Live this asteroid. This was actually a request from um, Helen Reed, uh, who, who put it to, to Paul in the community. Could, uh, could we get this particular asteroid? Asteroid Nimoy. That is incredible. Um, that's, just, that's just showing off again. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's yeah. I'm speechless now. Now, now I know what I'm looking at. I can now just stare at that for ages, going, "Hey, check it out, asteroid." That is brilliant. Uh, but of course, Hugh is bringing us something else from the south. This is very much the Southern Skies episode as planned. Yes, it came to work. Uh, so. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, just in CCD soft, it's a bit rough, but I can I can show you probably that's a bit better. I'm not sure if you're getting that, but that's just in a bit fewer. So that's a bit more of the detail. And then the image that I will use that on is uh, I recently did a Centaurus A image here. And so I, yeah, so I will use it to bring out a bit of the HA and this. this was an LRGB image, so, yeah. And uh, just so and people know, as, um, uh, Hugh is in the middle of Sydney, so the sky in, in Sydney is pretty much um, invisible to the to the human eye. <laughs> but using narrowband filters um, allows you to cut through um, all of that uh, light pollution from the ground uh, to be able to see this, this deep space stuff. And so Hugh builds these, um, these exquisite images with um, large amounts of, of, of stacking uh, with narrowband um, like that. It's just Yeah, so that's an eagle. That's from the middle of Sydney, the lagoon in Sydney. For the middle of Sydney. <laughs> that's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> so um, uh, just, just to explain quickly to, to our viewers, uh, I mean, these amazing images that you're seeing here, uh, I mean, these objects are beautiful. If you ever go to a dark site, you know, you can you can look at some of these objects. You won't see it like this, but you'll see these objects. But in the middle of Sydney, you're talking, there's, there's just light pollution everywhere from street lamps, from uh, buildings and everything. So, I mean, even stars kind of disappear apart from all but the brightest ones that make up the core constellations. So, narrowband filters, uh, they, they look for a very specific... Uh, segment of light, very specific wavelength, and everything else gets rejected. So light pollution disappears, and that is, yeah, you get that. Um, Hugh, can, can you give us a bit of information about how long it takes you to put together one of these images, and how many nights does it take, and, and sort of what yeah, do, you so, do you do the, the narrowband? Yeah, so um, this helix that's on the screen now, that's, um, I think that was probably about 18 hours worth. So I think I did that over three nights. Um, I don't really have a sort of specific order. I usually start out with HA just because it's the easiest to see what you're going to get. Um, this, the Helix is only HA and O3. There's no S2 in that, so it's a little bit quicker. But um, yeah, I mean, I think my 
the Eagle, I think, was probably about 12 or 13 hours or so. Um, wow. And then, so you know, the time, time it takes... It's not, it's not that long, like, really. No, it's not crazy. And my scope's a, a Takahashi uh, TSA-120, so it's 120 mil aperture, which isn't massive. Um, and my, my cameras are... Um, uh, for those that know, it's a, a KAF 8300 chip, which isn't super sensitive. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a lot of work in fix insight and a, you know noise reduction and careful mm -hmm. processing to get the best out of it, basically. That's the same. Yeah. CCDs. I mean, look at that. Now I'm I'm going to segue here. I did warn everyone that I was going to do this, so you know, <laughs> I, I I'm segueing here a little bit, <clears throat> but. I got myself a CCD camera now. Hey. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in love. I'm going I, to the dark side. I have moved to the dark side. Well, I have been using an SLR for deep sky stuff now, and learning and learning and learning, and wanting to travel back in time to go. Chris, two things: don't buy a fork mount. Never, never, never do that again. Um, and the other thing is. SLRs, no, um, just, yeah, these things. I mean, don't get me wrong, the SLRs are brilliant if you're getting into it, but if you really get addicted, then unfortunately your bank account will disappear to these little things. Um, but I am going to so point now, I, of course, buying astronomy gear means I have clouds. In fact, I'm suffering right now with clouds. I'm going to try and bring the sun live, but still clouds, my own fault. Um, so I did some dark frames uh, just to kind of compare the SLR to a CCD image. Now, I know this isn't particularly fair on SLRs, I suppose, but uh, if you guys should be able to see that, um, so this 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 grainy patch here is a dark frame taken with an SLR. Uh, so it's a basically 240 second exposure. We got nothing on the screen just yet. Can you guys see anything yet? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, technology. <laughs> Sometimes when it's in full screen. Sometimes I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Is anyone else able to see that? I, I can see that. Okay. I'll, I'll go with Kevin. I'll go with Kevin so, on that one. Well, oh, I went to a talk by the general manager of Attic Cameras a couple of years ago, and he was saying you need to take special care using dark frames with their cameras because they are so low in noise that you end up uh, introducing artifacts when you're using dark frames. Yeah, I've actually been told that unless I'm doing very long exposures, um, dark frames really are almost unnecessary for mm. this camera. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually intrigued to see how that holds out. But, I mean, this is this is a single 240-second um, exposure um, with an SLR, and then you take the same exposure length with the attic, and yeah, it's just like night and day, really, isn't it? It's it's I mean it's ridiculous. Um, so I'm a little bit excited. So I shall I shall start, but uh, I'm going to briefly before I jump over to Russell, uh, I'm going to quickly go two things with um, I this morning uh, I didn't actually have Very any nice. clouds, and I was able to get some solar activity which I'm hoping to bring live if I get a gap in the clouds. Um, this was taken in hydrogen alpha using my 60mm uh, Coronado HA telescope. And pretty nice, pretty nice view. Um, and then, of course, because Paul got to show off with that beautiful flare, uh, I get to wave goodbye to the active region as it goes around the limb now. Um, so bye-bye, uh, AR, whatever you were, and um, yeah, I hope to see you again. Glaring, um, I, and, and during the last show, and caused all those beautiful auroras um, across the state. So we we, we had a real um, good good run with this one. Um, and then if uh, he says, I'm going to close that too for a second. Uh, right, hi, I'm back. <laughs> so I'm going to skip over to Paul. Uh, Paul Russell. Now Russell. Hello Russell. There's some sunspots, which I'm guessing was yeah, that active Russell, region that we're waving yeah. goodbye to. So, uh, Russell, if you can uh, unmute yourself and tell us what we're looking at. Oh, maybe. Well, anyhow, we're looking at sunspots in white light. Um, I think that was that active region that we had earlier that gave us all those aurora. Yes. That is a pretty awesome picture, Russell. 
And hey, it's Russell's joined us, so it's about time, Russell. So that's good. <laughs> that's right. Russell's been behind the scenes um, in the community as well, um, helping us organise and whatnot. And uh, good to have him on the show. I uh, pretty much the, the you know the, the master brain chart behind this is like you know hey shall we shall we see what we can do I'm like yeah go for it and well, here we have it so this is Russell's sunspots and white light actually Russell produces some fantastic white light images of the sun and some great lunar images as well Russell's specialty I'd say is lunar really um his pictures his mosaics are, are pretty awesome uh, so well worth checking out um, as usual I will leave links to everyone that joined us tonight which is actually if you look at this now I mean I don't, Dylan will you not say this is a lot of people today this is pretty good yeah we've got a lot of live, live views um, we, we do have a question in the Q&A um, which is for Hugh I believe which is yep. from Keith Frost saying what is the amount of pass in the filters uh, the <laughs> bandwidth is um, my HA is a 5 nanometer, and my S2 and O3s are both 3 nanometer astrodons. Okay. Yeah, I thought, given that uh, this is my really the only spot I can image on a regular basis, it, I thought it was worth investing in, you know, very narrow filters. I went for the 5 uh, nanometer HA instead of the 3, um, as the 3 doesn't have the nitrogen line, so you get a slight less light basically. I mean okay. in hindsight I probably could have gone for the three and cut out a bit more light pollution but the five works fine for me. And, and actually some of those images I showed before uh, were on my old filters as well so I think that Eagle Nebula was on uh, just my beta like seven nanometer eight for S2 and eight and a half for O3 so yeah it's not absolutely necessary to have yeah, without revealing your location, you are actually in the city of Sydney, aren't you? Yeah, I'm like, uh, I'm basically in Darlinghurst, so I'm about <laughs> two or three from. Yeah, like I could almost see the harbour if I was about a foot taller. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The light pollution is, is thick, it's, you're in the middle of it. Yeah, I, I, can, I could count the stars for you right now and it wouldn't take you very long. Yeah. <laughs> Now I'm 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 going to just jump in for a split second because I I think oh it's a tease I I will I will jump back and say I just had the sun for a second then <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over to to Paul who is bringing us well this is this is a this is a cluster yep which one are we looking at this is M6 the butterfly cluster in Scorpius. Yeah. Okay, someone with a better imagination than me. Someone described the butterfly in that view to me. <laughs> actually, no. I think I, I think now. Actually, I'm, I'm using my imagination quite strongly. I think I can see it now. Um, I think, maybe. Can anyone see a butterfly? Let us know in Q and A. Can you see the butterfly in this? <laughs> Kevin, uh, can you see a butterfly? It's well. No, it's it's more obvious when you look at it in the eyepiece. I think that you, you can see the outline of the butterfly wings. You can't, I don't know, you can't see my cursor, but I, you can trace out the, the top wings. It's sort of up and down vertical in this image. Actually, I think I'm beginning to see it. Uh, that bright kind of uh, orangey tinted star on the left hand side, in my view, I think that's the bottom of one of the wings. Yes, that one. Yes, yes. yes. Ah, you see? See? You, uh, who says astronomers don't have colourful imaginations? I can see a butterfly now. And I think a lot of these names are unofficial. It's not like there's a board that sits down and, and authorises them, like the planets and things like that. So it really does come down to what people like us start using. So if uh, if I can get enough people on board to uh, to call a nebula the flying spaghetti monster nebula, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> flying spaghetti monster nebula. I like it. I, I think that would appeal to, to, to you know, getting kids into astronomy. You know, flying spaghetti monster. Who wants to see that? You know? Uh, now, exactly. talking of, uh, if you want to get official, it's MGC six four zero five. Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, uh, well, Susan. Uh, Susan unfortunately can't see the butterfly. Um, so uh, you just have to. I suppose you have to take the unofficial name for it as um, you know, just artistic squinting. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, as I was going to say, I mean, the, the NGC designation, nah, I don't like it so much. I, I'm, I'm going to call it Mothrak from now on. <clears throat> <laughs> now, Dylan, um, as anyone who watches the show will know, we have a Flickr group now uh, where you can share your images with us and we will give them a bit of a shout out on the show and have a talk about them. So, uh, uh, Dylan, right. we, what problem do we have for us? enough air to um, the Flickr group in the last few uh, shows, just because there's a lot going on all the time and um, and we do have to balance between the, the live scopes when we got them and, and when we don't. Um, so let me try and share some of what we have in the Flickr group this week. Can you see that okay? I am seeing NGC3628 and a bunch of others. Yes, we can. This is the Leo triplet from Annette Kale, and um, the, the Leo triplet itself is just a, a stunning little conjunction of galaxies, uh, but this one has an asteroid in the middle of it, Myra, which he captured accidentally, which has to be um, a really, really lucky, lucky shot. Um, you got to love that. So thanks for that, Annette Kale. We've had, we've had a live asteroid and a not-so-live asteroid. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and here we have one from Shah. Um, uh, this is Pluto. Um, Paul brought us a lot of Pluto uh, last week, which was just fantastic. And I just wanted to, to share Shah's here. Uh, Shah's one of our supporters uh, from Malaysia. Um, he's one of the uh, old broadcasters on Virtual Star Party as well. So he's a, a veteran of all of this stuff, long time astronomer. Um, really great work. Here's one from Mike Regett, which was just really visually quite um, quite compelling straight away. And, and there's something very um, wonderful about these showy, beautifully rich nebulas that I can't just get past. Like, I, I like planetary, I like the clusters, but I, I have a soft spot for nebulas, I've got to say. Um, and this sort of stuff, I just love. <laughs> I, I just can't get enough of them. Um, gamma C Nebula. Um, I'm, I'm terribly familiar with Northern Hemisphere. I'm yeah, that's that's the Swan. I know that one. Yes. <laughs> We're putting the global in global star party. That is awesome. Now I am going to be slightly greedy here, and whilst we look at oh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go with this one quickly. Segueing. <laughs> Another one from Char, AR 2371 and let's quickly get to you before the oh, clouds. Quick before the clouds. Yeah, no, no, clouds, clouds are coming in. Here we go. Well, there is, this is live, this is the sun from the UK. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to just move the scope a bit so the, I don't know if you can see my cursor at all, but there is that active region around the limb there. Um, so this is my laptop is running outside right now to get this view, and I'm going to just dump the exposure as high as I can, just to really blow this out. It says trying to drag the thingy. There we go. And there's all the prominences on the sun today, all kicking around. Uh, and the one on the bottom left-hand side is the one I showed an image of earlier. Um, we, but that time I had the Barlow in, but I decided to go full sun. If I was going to show the sun live, I was going to go full sun. Well, as full as the sensor allows me to do anyhow. But, uh, yeah. That's the prominences on the side. Um, and just, for, again, for the, any of the non-technical viewers at the moment, um, when we are taking photos, uh, or so quickly, video, basically, of the sun, the exposure that you set, um, which is the amount of light that you let in for each, uh, each frame, um, can be underexposed or overexposed depending on the detail that you want to see. So when we're looking at details uh, within the disk, um, we do have to set it um, quite fast to, to capture those. But then we pull it out so that we get more light coming in from each frame, and that allows us to see those outside edges where you can see those delicate features on the edge. I was going to say one thing I, I kind of enjoy doing is actually if it is quite cloudy and I've got the exposure very high, every time a cloud goes over you then because it, it drops the amount of light coming from the, the disk of the sun, you can actually see the details kind of moving around as they move the clouds. But uh, I'm just going to drop that exposure down again and there's the clouds. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, I finally chalked one up five episodes in and I've got a live view. 
England won. <laughs> England won. Uh, no pressure on trying to get number two. Uh, but yes, so that's my current live view. Now then, I'm going to nip to Andrew's live view. Uh, what have we got here, Andrew? Yeah, this is um, M22. Mesia 22. Is this another cluster? Yeah, <laughs> a globular cluster this time. Globular. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice, like it. Uh, what exposure time are we using for this one? This one's still 45 seconds. Nice, awesome. Can you um, just zoom that in a little bit more, Andrew, so we can see that uh, inner detail? And so I can check your guiding. <laughs> <laughs> Guiding's not too bad tonight. It's a little bit nice. wobbly, but, but well, I'm using the edge of the field. So. Uh -huh. There's a bit of high cloud about as well, so that there's probably a bit of high cloud going over and making it a bit wobbly. So. Trust me, I'd be happy with that, and that's because I use a fork mount. So pro tip, everyone watching, if you're going to buy a telescope and get into this, don't go fork mount. Just, just don't, don't do, do it. it. Just don't. Okay. Now then, Paul doesn't have a fork mount, but he does have a live view of something. <laughs> lagoon. This doesn't seem like the lagoon, maybe. That is awesome. Um, now, what about what constellations the lagoon nebula in? Maybe Sagittarius. Ah, the one that's really tricky to see from the north. I think we get it like a couple of degrees above the horizon every now and then. It's also technically, well, if you believe in that nonsense, my star sign would have been Sagittarius, but apparently I'm, these days I'm Ophiuchus because they forgot that one. So, you ah, know. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> this yeah, is, yeah, that's fantastic. Paul. So what, what, um, what are you imaging this? Uh, is this a narrowband image? I mean, what are we looking at here in terms of how you got this image? This is just um, three 60-second images in IGMP. Nice. Very nice indeed. Um, now then, uh, does this one look significantly different if you go narrowband? So if you did go, say, hydrogen alpha, I mean, is this one different looking? Do you get to see more? The lagoon? Yes. Yeah, that's what I showed before if you'd like to see one. <laughs> oh, oh yes, that was, yes. Go on then, go on. Uh, there you go. Yeah, the lagoon is, is big and bright. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot, especially in, in HA, it's really bright, hydrogen alpha. <coughs> that is a lot of hydrogen alpha up there. Now, hydrogen alpha, uh, I'll let Dylan uh, do the technical one on this one. So when we're looking at hydrogen alpha, what are we looking at? So hydrogen is the um, predominant chemical that comes from our sun and a lot of the other stars in the uh, in the universe, and when we're looking at emission nebulas like uh, like the lagoon, you basically the the clouds and dust are charged, just like the auroras are charged um, when uh, when they get excited by solar winds. And so when we're, when we're looking at an emission nebula, that's when it's glowing red. That's when it's glowing that beautiful pink that we see in Paul's um, uh, lagoon, natural lagoon color now. Um, and it's no coincidence that um, the, the, it is the, the, the most abundant um, chemical in our solar system and, and in, in a lot of the, the, the universe as we know it. So it's no, it's no coincidence that we ourselves um, as humans are made up primarily of hydrogen because we are made up of, of a lot of water and a lot of water comes with a lot of hydrogen. Um, and that's, um, that's because we come from a star <laughs> made of hydrogen. So yeah, hydrogen. Hydrogen, it's awesome, and so is oxygen and sulfur in less lesser quantities. <laughs> um, which is now Hugh is looking like he's trying to find something near some the Triffid Nebula. Uh, like just Triffid. plate solving. <laughs> ah, uh, can you demo this for us, Hugh? Because I was just talking to Chris about this, and you put me on yeah. this. Just sure, I'll nice. I'll go through it. So what I'll do is I'll just clear my. Uh, EQ mod sync. So EQ mod now doesn't know basically where I'm pointing. It thinks I'm pointing there. So my like process for this, uh, my process for this is I take a 20 second bin two by two 
luminance exposure. So I'll knock one of those out. Then I use Astro Tortilla, which is an awesome bit of free software. Of all the awesome bits of software I've come across, I'd like to buy this guy a beer. It's awesome. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so anyway, so you'll see... There we go. So my 20-second image is done. I'll just quickly save. Save. All right, so Astro Tortilla. Uh, all right, so you can see it's going through its thing. And I use um, Stellarium with Stellarium Scope to point the telescope. And you'll see when it solves, it should update this position. So that's where it thinks it is. The, the selection there means nothing. I've just selected that. Um, so yeah, so it's keep an eye taken, out. you've taken a photo and said to the computer, where do you think this is? And the computer's going, let me look at all those stars. Do -do 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 -do. And then figures out and where here we go. wrong you are. Uh, hopefully, now that <laughs> I'm actually doing it. <laughs> it looks like it's solving. <laughs> It just solved in 20 seconds before, so hopefully it does it again. <laughs> Here we go. There you ah, go. There you go. Yeah. So that's where we are now pointing. And if we have a quick look, I'll just do a really quick... Uh, let's have a look. So hopefully we should be seeing... Yeah, there it is. So we're not spot on, but there's a little trippin'. Nice. It's I just so fast. I'm going to have to invest yeah. in this technology. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Any, any, anyone that tries to find objects in space will know that, you know, it, it can be really hard sometimes. You may be just a little bit off, and you're there looking at these stars, scratching your head, going, now which way do I have to move to find this? Um, <laughs> and that looks <laughs> pretty awesome. Um, and Andrew has some faint kind of fuzzy there, which I am going to put all the pressure on Kevin and go, hey, Kevin, tell us what we're looking at. <laughs> Where is Andrew? <laughs> Looks like uh, Fitzy Amiga, maybe M7E. Is he right, Andrew? That's correct. Hey. <laughs> all right, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll count that as chalking one up for, uh, for Oz. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, so, can we? Can you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? Is that for me or for Andrew? Yeah, that, that's Kevin. I'm going to go for Kevin. Oh, okay. Well, it, it's another em hydrogen alpha emission nebula. Uh, it's, it's not far away from the Eagle Nebula as far as you're looking at the sky. So it's in. Uh, it's in. It's not in Scorpio. It's in. Uh, no, it's it's just just off there. Uh, so again, not not a one for the, the northern observers. Uh, it's about four, maybe five thousand light years away. So it's in the same sort of ballpark distance-wise as M16 or the, the Eagle. Uh, it goes under a few different names. Call it call it the Omega Nebula. It's also known as the Checkmark Nebula or it goes by a few different pseudonyms. One. Nice. I think they call it Swan, don't they? Swan? I don't know. I think this is this is why I, I look forward to winter, clear skies, and then being able to go, haha, I'm looking at northern stuff and confuse other people. Um, oh, nice. That's a bright well, the swan. Explosion. The Swan Nebula, of course. How did I forget the Swan Nebula? I think I even you, Chris. You can see that, Chris. I know you can see it. I he's he's facing to the, facing down towards the left of the screen. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing I, I'm mm. seeing kind of a the the body pointing upwards towards the right, and then the the hook mm. of the neck coming down to the left, looking down. Yes, that's yeah, what I see. He's a swan, the swan nebula. Yeah, very interpretive, though, really, like an ink block test. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, so it's, it's one giant Rorschach test. <laughs> if you start seeing, you know, death and murder everywhere, you might want to see a psychologist. Um, now, I, I'm, I, I am going to, I'm going to be somewhat, somewhat selfish here and jump back to me because, you know what, the, the, the clouds, the clouds are leaving me alone a little bit. 
and I have sun, and I, I have to I have to share the sun because you know it's there. And, and well. you know. yeah, I know, right? I've got a look because I've still got my tilt adapter into the camera. I've got a little bit of um, Newton ring uh, going on there, but. Uh, it's like the, the, the tilt adapter takes away the Newton rings if I've got a Barlow in, but seems to add them back into the image if I have no Barlow. And this is a no Barlow image. Oh, clouds, hello, you see? Like that. <laughs> I saw you come on. It's, it's live, folks, and clouds can hear anytime you talk about space. So, um, live clouds, that's a very British thing, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> we'll theme it that way. But, uh, yep. Ladies and gentlemen, live. You can't control the weather, but we, so far, and you see, I'm going to jinx it now by saying this. Sorry, it's going to start raining for everyone now, but we have actually had live views at every show. Five, five, five episodes, five lots of live views. I mean, you know, five times Paul Stewart, too. But, you know, it's, it's yeah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and Russell is still diligently sharing that brilliant picture of those things. Um, I love that. I love white light. I, white light's a pretty inexpensive way of getting into solar imaging. Um, but solar imaging is dangerous. And I'm going to show this because this is what happened last yeah. episode. Uh, you should be able to see that, hopefully. <laughs> so, uh, this yeah, this... Public service announcement. Yes, imaging the sun, if you're not paying attention, can be dangerous. Very dangerous. And, uh, well, Paul, I'll, I'll let you explain um, <clears throat> what happened here. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what happens if you, when you swap bits in and out of your telescope and don't cap them when you're finished. And you will melt holes in plastic. And, again, public safety announcement, in your eyeballs, if you're looking at it without a proper scope or filters. So don't do it, kids, because it melts plastic, and it will sure as heck send you blind. So, uh, yeah. It's just like burning ants with a magnifying glass, except you are the ant. Yes, and we don't also encourage burning ants, of course, because, you know, poor little critters. Uh, although I did, did learn whilst in Australia that honey ants are quite tasty. Mm -hmm. It's a very weird mm. thing to Australia, but anyhow, I'll go into that another day. <laughs> and Andrew is guiding on something. I've um, probably got a few more pictures to get through on the Flickr if you want to uh, do a bit of that. Alrighty, let's, let's have a look at some Flickr pictures. <laughs> Sunspot group from Wendy Clark. Thank you very much, Wendy Clark, for submitting to our brand new Flickr group. Nice. Now then, this this Flickr group that we have, uh, anyone who takes astrophotos, whether that be through an SLR, a fancy fancy telescope, or through even through your iPhone or other similar handheld device, you know, feel free to add them to the Flickr group. Um, which he says when I pull up the link. We got inundated, so um, there's no way we're going to be able to get through all of them, but I'd recommend just going and, and checking them all out anyway because um, they're great. It, the, the, the sorts of people that are doing amateur astronomy now are of such a high level um, that back in the old film days, um, those guys, as skilled as they are, um, we're just not coming close to the kinds of stuff that we can get out of the uh, equipment and stacking and uh, fast, fast lens setups and, and all the technology that we have at our, at our disposal now. It's really, really great time. And uh, this is this is one thing that I think uh, anyone who's has looked at old astronomy books and then look at the pictures that you know the guys that post in this group can produce now. I mean, the image that that amateurs can produce are better than images NASA could produce only but a few yeah. decades ago. I mean, this this is um, how much the technology has opened up and, and gone to the general public. Um, you know, there was a time where buying a solar telescope was an unthinkable purchase. It's still not cheap, but it, it's now doable. It's, it's a much more manageable thing if you're into this kind of thing. So uh, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, this picture here, uh, Dylan, we're looking at M81. Anyone from um, I don't uh, know his name, only his handle, Jukalaxo. Um, <laughs> I believe he 
came to us through my Instagram channel, perhaps. There's a, a lot of great um, astronomers on Instagram as well. Even despite the 512 by 512 resolution limit, um, really great community of astronomers there too. So definitely worth checking out. Um, I think there's another one. Ah, there's uh, Corey Schmitz is also someone that I came to first through um, Instagram. Um, but his work is just unbelievable. I believe he works from South Africa, yep. And so they have access to our beautiful southern skies from South Africa. And uh, he and his wife Tanya just produced some amazing, amazing stuff. Well worth checking out all of his socials. Um, the Trifford Nebula here, which is actually uh, what Hugh is um, busily emitting away there as well. Um, so we'll get back to um, to Hugh's view a bit later. Trying to. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It is. It's a small target, really. Um, I find uh, in well, for my hyperstar setup, it's really, really quite dainty um, compared mm. to Lagoon, which is. Uh, and uh, prior to our earlier conversation, Dylan, this is why you need to put down the drug that is hyperstar <laughs> and get back to some serious telescope magnification. <laughs> No, I have hyperstar jealousy, definitely. <laughs> I, I love to be an F2. I, oh, I, 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 would, I would love some hyperstar, but uh, because I'm stuck to um, with an F6 reducer down to, what, 1,200 mil? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck to uh, F6. And some, <laughs> some decent zoom. If I didn't have the... Um, if I didn't have the focal reducer, I'd be at 2,000 odd mil, so two meters worth of focal length, because it's a yeah. Schmidt-Kasperin telescope. So it's short and stumpy, but it's got a lot of zoom, which is what Dylan needs mm -hmm. to get into, a lot of zoom. <laughs> well, you know, there's the Schmidt-Kasperin grains sort of get a bit of a bad rap for the deep sky stuff. Um, I think they're well regarded for planetary, um, but I think the hyperstar really changes that, that altogether, even though it's a much wider field, you're sacrificing that, that big magnification that you get with the schmidt grains, but you get such beautiful clarity um, and speed, so I think it's a good setup. <laughs> now then, uh, you see someone with a B14 and a, and a hyperstar on it, there's not much that could, you know, beat that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Perfect yeah. marriage. I'm mm. just going to, uh, okay, so it seems, um, I'm trying to figure out what Andrew is tracking here. I, 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 I'm, I, although his guiding graph, you see, you're seeing some inner workings here. Um, I think I'm uh, guiding on cloud at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shall skip over to Paul then. Oh, okay. I'm seeing. And I'm, uh, bear with me because I'm not. I'm not particularly good at this, but I think I'm seeing pillars of creation in here. Am mm -hmm. I seeing things? Okay. You would be right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Actually, I can see these from the north, technically. Um, I've just never actually tried to image them because I'm under light from the skies. But, um, no so, excuse. All right, fine. Um, so, <laughs> uh, how, what did you do to take this one? This is the same three sets of 60 RGB. You bring in the speed. That's, uh, so, you know, if, if there's one thing that can be said about Paul when it comes to providing live views, he's um, he's uh, got some quick turnaround time getting that scope moved around. Yeah. I suppose you don't whack your head on those weights, Paul. Now, I don't know if, um, if our regular viewers, our regular viewers probably have them, but if you're new to this, um, Paul's got this, this brilliant observatory set up where you can see his head kind of pop up from the bottom corner and behind him, or normally very close to his head, are a, very, are a set of weights and you do kind of worry that he's going to whack his head one day. Um, and this is um, a beautiful object. I mean, I've seen this in, in narrowband a lot because I've been researching for uh, narrowband imaging, but um, I didn't realize it would show up so well um, even in RGB, especially at such short exposures too. Um, I was going to say, do you have much light pollution around you, Paul, or are you just completely in the middle of nowhere? Oh, it's a little bit, it's just a small town here. Nice. We actually looked at um, Paul's location on the light pollution data map and it was bathed in light. We couldn't work out what it was. It was like he was in a, in a city. Um, we think that it was that the satellite data was looking at potentially fishing vessels nearby off the coast 
um, that were just emitting um, large amounts of light. But it is um, it was erroneous data. All is at a fairly dark location in New Zealand. I was going to say, um, if I try to do that from my backyard, which I will try for comparison's sake with an SLR uh, without any light pollution kind of limiting factors involved, uh, I will just get a kind of washed out smudge with maybe the tiniest of hints that there's something in there. But I, I will try and do that when I get a chance. Um, that is a really nice image, Paul. Thank you for bringing that. I, I had the, um, the good fortune to take uh, this particular target last week. And there's just something about, because it was part of um, the Pillars of Creation, that iconic Hubble image, this sort of a little happy dance that you do when you see it pop up on the screen there, and you go, yes, I took it with my telescope in my backyard. Absolutely. Same thing that Hubble saw. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the great appeals of it. Um, I remember people turning around to me going, oh, you can look it in a book. I was like, that's not the fun. That's, that's not the point. You don't go fishing to catch fish, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that was to have beers. Um, I mean, exactly. I mean, Kevin. I mean, you're you're a fantastic hmm. um, picture of uh, Saturn that you, you recently got. I mean, without getting too poetic on us or, or welling up, but I mean, how did you find that experience of of, of getting that picture? Oh, well, I mean, I, I agree with what you said before. I mean, you, I can go to the Cassini database and see much better pictures than any I could possibly ever take. But, you know, like Dylan said, getting out there with your own telescope, looking up and fiddling with the computer and getting the focus and capturing the frames and putting it together and you say, that's something I made. And you, and you make it how you like. You know, you can make it look like, like with the deep sky imaging, you can make it look like the Hubble images if you like. You can make it look the way you want to look. You can mix up the R, G, and B images, uh, uh, R, G, and B frames, and, and change the colours to, to how, how it suits your eye, and you can make it yours. It's, it's one object, but it, there's many different interpretations. All of these false colour imaging methods that we use, hydrogen, alpha, sulphur, oxygen, etc., they're all false colour. We, we allocate them to R, G and B channels in Photoshop and it has no correlation at all with reality. You, know, they, they, you, you, put, you put hydrogen alpha in the green channel. And hydrogen alpha is not green, it's deep red. And so, you know, the pictures that you see by Hubble, the pictures that someone like Hugh puts out, it's, it's his interpretation of, of the image. I mean, it's real data, it's not imaginary. But it's what he's made of it, and and that's what astrophotography is. is it's what you make of the data you collect. I mean, mm. this is um, mm. I mean, it has. Well, I, that's that's fantastic. I mean, it, I completely agree. I mean, astrophotography is as much of um, it's it's it is it has its its, its scientific. Obviously, you know, objects in space. The the research that goes into these things is obviously very scientific, but it has that artistic element to it where you do take this data, mm. which is of uh, I'm. You know, it all has some scientific value, um, but you you make it to uh, become a picture that you want. Um, however, I mean, you were saying that um, hydrogen alpha is a deep red, which it very much is, and those green greenish tints that you see in in these photos is obviously not reality. But it, the false color imaging actually has its uses in the sense that you can distinguish between different gas regions within nebula much more easily visually so you can see actually what's going on within that nebula as well so yes hydrogen alpha isn't bright green but if you separate it out from the oxygen 3 and sulfur 2 wavelengths and you you make those all sorts of interesting colors your eyes pick up on this and can kind of make out no. more detail so no, I, I'm I sure it has, it has scientific value but I think you know people who are just putting together images for the sake of putting, making pretty images. You you can allocate the the, the channels whichever colour you like. It, it doesn't really matter. It's just uh, you exactly. know the Hubble palette is what it is. It's it's you you can do what you like. There's no there's no rules. Mm. And you're cheating it so much. The data that you know what you do to it to make a nice image is so far from what. Scientists do when they process their data, basically. Oh, you absolutely! Know. By the time you finish noise reduction and yeah. and blurring, and uh, it, it, you, you process these process these images to the nth degree, and what you're left with is is a piece of art. It's 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 not the science that the Hubble Space Institute is putting out. We're, you know, I don't know that any of us are actually doing science when we do astrophotography. 
No, not me. I mean, not, I mean, not not me personally. And uh, I know you know there are guys out there who are chasing comets and they're, they're chasing asteroids and making discoveries, and and that's great for them. You know, hats off. But for me, it's just about you know finding objects and and making good looking pictures of them, or as as good looking as I can make them. I mean, despite us taking, um, I, I mean, astrophotography, yes, it's very much an art form, and despite us taking artistic pictures, um, I think the value to science is not so much in the data collected, but just in the fact that we are communicating, I mean, this, this show as well, we are communicating what is out there and getting people interested in the subject, which I think is, is a very important thing, especially with um, schools and educational facilities in general having limited budgets, that, um, to be able to reach out and, and share these pictures and inspire people to maybe get into it or look further into it, I think has its own merit, not directly scientifically, but maybe potentially mm -hmm. making future scientists. Um, yeah. oh, I often visit my, my kids' school and, and talk to them. They, they, they love The kids just love it. I show them my pictures. I talk to them about New Horizons. I, you know, they, they, they just soak it up. They, they love it at that age. And, and they're getting out there and sharing your own enthusiasm, your own passion. It's, Nothing, nothing sparks someone else's interest like seeing someone who's so passionate about something. And which is, I would say, which is what really sparked this show. There was this kind of mm -hmm. urge to, for us all to reach out and go, hey, you know, check the stuff out there. And, I mean, I'm going to click on um, Andrew's view right now, and look, we've got, we've got live moon. I mean, this is... I was wondering how long it would be before someone showed us the moon tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it is there, oh pesky moon. It's a bit hazy at the moment, it has a nice ethereal glow. If we're talking a little bit artistic here, you know, it's quite nice. Right. It's enhanced, as Kevin would say. Now, <laughs> well, it's, it's, I'd have to say it's oriented for our northern viewers. Why is it upside down? No, 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 this is the right way around. I like this. this is the, I'm not feeling dizzy <laughs> right now. I haven't got a rotator on the uh, camera, so... You see, you have to correct for this, this upside-down nonsense you give us. You see, you, it's all pretend. Now, Hugh, how goes the capturing? Oh, it's, as you can see, if you look at my screen, there is 1,120 seconds left on this exposure, so get back to me later. <laughs> 1,120 seconds and counting. Oh. Yeah, I'm doing 30-minute doing exposures on this, so wow. it'll be a while. Well, in that case, then, I'm going to look at a very large collection of stars, because that's the scientific term, stars, and ask what Paul's looking at. I uh, just pointed the scope at the center of the galaxy towards Sagittarius A star and took an image. So basically what you're saying is you're bringing us a live black hole. Yeah, somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's in there, we promise. <laughs> it is in there, but by its very definition it's kind of tricky to find. In fact, technically there could be loads of them. I believe I saw an article saying that there's lots of black holes swimming around in the middle of our galaxy. So, um... Let's hope none of them will go rogue and kind of head this way. Although we won't really know about it and, until everyone starts getting, you know, 20 foot tall thanks to spaghettification. But uh, nice. What was the exposure time on this one? Uh, it's 30 seconds each channel. Nice. Nice. I was going to say, I, I'm thinking I'm seeing a little bit of star color uh, in the screen here. Um, a little bit of cover of some reddish kind of hue stars at the bottom right hand on the screen there. Um, I was going to say star color is one thing I've yet to properly achieve without really uh, it's something I need to practice. Although I've been told that CCDs are better for it, so I shall give it a go. Uh, I'm going to click on Dylan now. What do we got here, Dylan? Uh, we are looking at the Green Nebula, which we were just discussing before, and had live views from Paul. Um, and, and we saw that beautiful uh, narrowband image um, from Hugh as well. Uh, this one is done with a hyperstar, so it is a mere 42 minutes. So it smashed it out with under an hour. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say that's cheating. I'm sorry. And, and, and until, you, until you bring us some proper zoomed in stuff, every time you bring out the hyperstar, I'm going to be A, jealous, and B, you're cheating. You're cheating, sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, for everyone watching, um, Hyperstar takes a Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope, makes it extremely wide field, and takes it from a normal F10 down to F2, which, if you know anything about photography, is very, very fast. 
Um, so exposure times get cut ridiculously when using Hyperstar, which means Dylan's cheating. <laughs> of course. And um, I should say before, on that note about um, amateur astronomy and just astrophotography in general, um, there is some value in just the sheer number of people out there pointing their scopes at the skies. These massive telescopes um, that scientists spent time on and, and organise, they can't, they can't be all eyes everywhere at once. And they do have some solutions, um, fiber optic, um, you know, mass, mass sky survey technology that they can, they, they can do. But they rely on the, um, the amateur community a lot to identify um, anomalies in the skies, like supernova hunting, and and still comet hunting as well um, can 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 be really the the um, purview of the amateur astronomy crowd. So it's still something that um, that we do contribute a bit of scientific value to, um, and can still pull out some pretty pictures at the same time. I was going to say, um, amateur astronomers, I think because we do have access to, we're not limited by, you know, budgets and, and time constraints, just clouds mostly and, and uh, you know, normal jobs and, and kids and things like that, of course. But, uh, you know, supernovas um, are, I think, one thing where amateur astronomers can really contribute because, you know, you know, we're imaging some random bit of the sky that a scientist wouldn't necessarily think of to look at and boom, there's a supernova and things like that. Um, comet hunters are especially, of course, um, Lovejoy. Um, Terry Lovejoy, uh, you'll see a lot of comets, Lovejoy, Lovejoy something or other with a year, mm -hmm. and that's one that he's found. Well, I think it's him and his wife, I think they're a team, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, I mean, there's a, there's a man who, you know, because he can point his scope wherever he wants, um, can spot these things. So if you are an amateur astronomer, you never know, you may get something named after you. Um, there was... Um, an article kicking around in some local newspapers where a 15-year-old boy, I believe in the UK, I was looking through some old um, spectrum data um, for various stars, and it's like, hang a minute, there's a dip in the light here, and it turns out the guy discovered a planet at the age of 15. So, you know, <laughs> I did read about that actually. Yeah. Um, I'm a, and then, all, of course, all my regulars at the bar that I work at are like, Chris, yeah, you're slacking a bit, aren't you? If a 15-year-old can find a planet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, slightly mean there. Um, now, we are, believe it or not, an hour has actually passed, so I'm going to have to consider wrapping this up, folks, I'm afraid. Um, and I'm assuming Hugh has many thousands of seconds to go, or a few hundred. Uh, I can show you one I took earlier, like okay. this one. <laughs> so this I took a couple of weeks ago, so let me just find it. Where is it? There it is. <laughs> there it is. Whoa. It is, it is a dainty little target. Yeah. Especially in HA because you don't get the uh, the reflection nebula part, the blue bit that you normally get in a color image. Yep, yep. Yeah. So more of them. And it's actually a 20 minute exposure. I didn't realize it. So I'm going to stop mine 10 minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, that's, that's uh, an object that I have actually seen. Ah, uh, I went to a dark site once and got to see it very briefly before, guess what, Klaus came and joined the party, so um, <laughs> that's fantastic. Now, um, Hugh's work is very well regarded on Instagram, but I know there's some other places we can find you, Hugh, where, um, where, do, where would you send people uh, to? I, I've been neglecting it, but I have a blog where I post some stuff, which is just hugha, H-U-G-H-D-A dot com. And actually, I need to check because last time I looked, my domain provider had screwed up and it wasn't working. So, um, but if you just search for, I don't know, Hue and astrophotography, I'm sure you'll find yeah. my WordPress blog <laughs> or something. Awesome. Um, we or, will um, astro underscore Hue on Instagram. Yes. I shall start following you in just a moment then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, especially considering that you are in the middle of light polluted Sydney, so that is that is yeah. really yeah. There's a little jet here so that's uh, quite cool on, on uh, higher res images. I'm not sure if you can just make it out there, but there's a little very cool little spiky jet. Oh which wow. I've just managed to capture in this image. But it's quite pronounced in like your higher res and like Hubble images and stuff. It's pretty amazing. Yep. It's like a little horn. I ain't going yeah. to Google that. 
how it's <laughs> So, um, for everyone watching, I hope that has inspired you to, uh, well, first of all, consider narrowband imaging if you're already an imager, because light pollution seems to just disappear with it, and I'm quite excited by the prospects of that. Uh, <laughs> check out Hugh's, um, Hugh's work. It looks fantastic. I'm going to start following you on Instagram and check out what you've done. Um, and that is fantastic. And I'd also like to thank um, Andrew for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Awesome. And where can we find you? Uh, usually hovering around here somewhere or on, on Twitter. Um, I should have my link up there somewhere. Um, ah, yes. Yeah. So we'll find you. And uh, any kind of projects you've got going at the moment, imaging-wise, or is it just a, get a clear night and see what you can find? It's yeah. I I just go around and see what I can find. Um, I'm still building up my equipment. I've got to buy a light pollution filter. Um, so we'll see how we go and uh, uh, yeah, we'll try and find some objects that we can uh, show you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and bringing us the live. You're welcome. Uh, I'm now going to jump over to Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Yes, Chris. <laughs> Good of you to join us. That's right. I was just trying to pull up a photo of that uh, spike that you was trying to show us before. Uh, if I can, just before we hang up the hangout, I'll just screen share that. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's the spike. That's that jet he was pointing out in his own image. This is Hubble Space Telescope data. Wow. Okay, yeah. that, that's a genuine. That's it. I mean, that's, every time I look at this stuff, it's like, whoa. <laughs> well, that was that was what I processed from the uh, Hubble data. Wow. Nice. Of course, I forget that um, they provide a lot of raw data, so that's that's awesome. Mm. Um, well, that I'm for the picking on cloudy days. <laughs> yes, yes, get, practice those processing techniques and look at stuff you could be looking at, um, although not in that high resolution. Um, you know, thank you, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing that out to everyone. So, yeah, check that out, folks. Um, and, of course, where can we find you um, if we want to, you know, see what All kind right. of things you're getting? I'm always hanging around on Google+. Plus. I post nearly everything I do there. Awesome. Well, I've, started, I've started posting to Flickr, but uh, still, still uploading a catalogue. Ah. Ah, right. Well, uh, check out Kevin Franklin on Google Plus then. Uh, his, his satin photo from a couple of weeks back is still as awesome as ever. Um, so well worth checking out. Um, and now I'm going to check out Paul's currently showing us. Oh, that's something. Could this that? Hmm. Yes. Tarantula. The tarantula nebula. Nice. I like the name. I can't see a spider though, but um, I like the name. You need a large Magellanic cloud, a very um, populous star region. Nice. Um, so, Paul, uh, where can we find you, and where are you bringing this from? You can find me on Twitter under Astro Stew or from Google Plus under Paul Stewart NZ. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, see what I mean, folks? See what I mean? Those weights. I swear down one day your noggin is going to get whacked. <laughs> it's nicely sponge padded. It's be right. <laughs> yeah, still the, still the bar between you and them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you, you've already melted, um, you know, caps. So, you know, if you end up with a you know, black eye or something, you know. Yeah. Blood, sweat, and tears is astronomy like, I tell you. So thank you very there you much. go, there's a fresh one. Finally finished my 20 minute image. And I think it's probably even a bit sharper than the old one. That's good. Nice. Little, nice. Like there. And I just had to, uh, almost got a police helicopter through my field of view. So that's a, <laughs> another hazard of imaging in the city. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. And also, uh, thank you to uh, Trevor for joining us and you know, watching us live from the peanut gallery.
don't know if you can hear him at the moment, but as ever, folks, uh, you can find us all on various locations, um, and you can find this this whole cacophony of crazy people who share their views live to the internet at uh, Global Star Party on Twitter. Uh, you can find us on our Google Plus page. Also, conveniently enough, Global Star Party. It's pretty easy to remember this. Uh, you can find us on Flickr as, you guessed it, Global Star Party. Um, please uh, feel free to post any recent um, images or even some older images that you've um, taken um, with some details and descriptions of how you got them, where you got them from, and we will give you a shout out on the show and, um, you know, uh, check them out and describe what we're looking at and try to explain as best as we can uh, with our great scientific minds, e.g. mostly Kevin to be fair, um, uh, what we're looking at. So um, please, and thank you to all those that have posted images to the Flickr group. Um, I was giving them a quick browse earlier as the show was going on and me looking for clouds and uh, some fantastic pictures up there, quite an influx of them. So uh, yeah, please continue adding photos and we shall give them a shout out every weekend. Um, next weekend is going to be the American nighttime edition, so it should be sunny and bright, fingers crossed, for everyone down south. So um, hopefully some maybe some southern sun and hopefully some uh, nighttime uh, northern objects uh, or at least uh, nighttime objects from the other side of the planet. Um, it will be probably about 3 o'clock in the morning for me again, but if it is clear, I will try to get something. Uh, I have Saturn available at that time in the morning, so you never know, I might chalk up a second one on this show. But five episodes in, and we've had live views every episode. So next episode is probably going to be clouds and rain and lightning and hurricanes and all sorts, so, um, which is standard. Uh, thank you to also to my co-host and conspirator Dylan tonight. No problem. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, Dylan. You've always been at the, uh, at the helm um, herding all of us cats, so thank you for that. Well, uh, I now have uh, a bit of a gauntlet to throw down to you at the end of this show before we say good night or good morning, depending on how it is. But <clears throat> you, you're not allowed to uh, shave that head of yours until you bring us live views. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Li live views, or else that hair is going to get longer throughout the year. If you've got a ponytail, I'm going to be, you know, disappointed, but laughing at the same time. And then, because I'm into my, my time-lapse photography, I will take a screenshot from every show before he brings a live one, and we can watch his hair growth back time-lapse, finally. <laughs> so, yeah, Perfect. no pressure there, mate. No pressure. Oh, I'll um, get there, I promise. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to click on Andrew quickly because he's got some more nib uh, nebula. That's not a nebula, Chris. That's a cluster. That's that's a pretty cool cluster. Globular. It's, it's globular, globular. It's a glob. It's a fuzz. And it is awesome. Uh, so thank you, everyone, to join for joining us uh, today, tomorrow, yesterday, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I hope this hasn't been too crazy for you. Thank you for everyone that shared out their live views today. And please, uh, check us out, watch the old episodes, and if you've got a telescope and the ability to bring in a live view, uh, come join us. Come share the madness, come share the night skies, and uh, let's, let's show the world what's out there. And also, let's watch Dylan's hair grow. So thank you, everyone, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>